My name is Javert. Was that at least as good as Russell Crowe? OK, so um, we're ready to get started. Um, first, uh, a quick quote. Chemistry is to biology what notation is to music. Um, to me, this really uh, grabs at the essence of chemical biology in the sense that the notations on a musical scale allow creativity. They allow other performers to interpret the works in new ways and um, give the work context. Chemistry does that in biology. Chemistry gives us an opportunity for us to be creative about biology and invent new ways of thinking about biology. It's sort of the underlying basis at the level of atoms and bonds, as I keep saying, uh, for biology. And to me, in some way, this really captures what we're trying to do in this class. OK. Um, hmm. So uh, this week, we're, uh, it's already week three, which is amazing. Oh, hang on. OK, so it's week three. So we're up to chapter three. And we're going to be talking about DNA. Um, our knowledge of DNA was really uh, set in place by uh, the people in front of you. These are the giants, really, in the field of structural biology who determined structures of DNA um, in the 1950s. This includes the great Rosalind Franklin, whose very accurate X-ray diffraction structures, her pictures of the X-rays diffracting off of fibers of DNA, uh, set in motion the determination of the structure. She was working with Maurice Wilkins. And two physicists, Francis Crick and Jim Watson, went on to solve the structure of DNA. And as we'll see in a moment, really one of their key insights was at the level of atoms and bonds in the sense that they discovered uh, an interesting tautomerization of the DNA bases that made it possible to have what we now call Watson-Crick base pairing between the strands of DNA. Getting a little ahead of myself, but uh, that's where we're going in the next week or so. Um, so we're going to be finishing up non-covalent interactions, then talking about DNA structure, DNA property, and finally DNA reactivity of small molecules. This is a large chapter. We have a lot to talk about. So um, uh, bear with me. Things are going to go uh, not faster. It's going to be the same speed. But we're going to gloss through a few topics that are less important. And when we do, um, this means then that you can focus your reading and your study uh, just on the level of detail that we're covering in the class. OK. Um, some announcements. In the textbook, read chapter three. Uh, again, skim concepts not presented in lecture. Don't get too worked up about them. Um, chapter three problems, do all the odd numbered and all the asterisk problems. Um, in addition, I want to encourage you to get involved here at UC Irvine. This is uh, super important. Many of you I know uh, aspire to become physicians or scientists or pharmacists or whatever it is that you aspire to do. Um, all those big plans require preparation. They require some evidence that you've gone beyond the ordinary. And um, I want to encourage you to do this, OK? Um, one way to get involved is to look around for uh, opportunities to volunteer. This is one that's run by my friend, uh, who is the, one of the founders, called the Social Assistance Program for Vietnam. Uh, if you go to this website, there are opportunities to volunteer to spend two weeks in Vietnam, in a rural part of Vietnam, um, administering medicine. You know, you'll probably not be, of course, you know, drilling people's teeth and uh, you know, doing open heart surgery. But you will get a unique opportunity to actually see those types of things happening. And um, that's really uh, important if you aspire to that kind of career. Uh, it provides evidence that you're qualified, that you're committed, and um, that you're someone who's altruistic. All of those things professional and uh, graduate schools look for in your application. You need to be doing those things now. Okay? And I'm on your side on this. Okay? I will help you get and uh, find those opportunities. I'll bring them to your attention like this one. And if there's something in particular that I can do to connect you with, uh, let me know and I'll do my very best on your behalf. OK, um, along those lines, uh, our laboratory always has openings for talented undergraduates. Um, it's competitive, but um, you have a chance to uh, participate at the full level of graduate student. Undergraduates in our laboratory are doing actual science. They're publishing papers with us. They're um, making discoveries. And they're participating as full members of the team. Um, OK, here's how you apply. Uh, send me a paragraph describing your career goals and how research in our laboratory would advance those uh, career and educational goals. 
Um, in addition, send me a copy of your college level transcripts. This includes any transcripts at community colleges if you're transferring. Many of my best students are transfer students. Send me those transcripts as well. And also send me three names uh, and email addresses of TAs who know you well in lab sections. Okay, and I'm going to email them and I'm going to ask them, what, what, what was this person like uh, in the laboratory? Uh, were they, you know, the first one out of the room or the last one out of the room? Um, did they, you know, follow you around the laboratory asking you, does this look pink? Does this look pink? Or were they pretty independent? Okay, so I'll find out about that sort of thing. And then that's how I make uh, a decision on who to accept into the laboratory. Okay, um, and then, uh, of course, the resume. Um, this is pretty standard. If you're interested in doing research here at UC Irvine, which I highly, highly encourage you to do, this is a pretty good way to go about it, okay? This is a, a, an effective way to get noticed and to get that job that you need, okay? Any questions about these opportunities? Why I think they're important, things like that? Okay, see me in office hours if there's something in particular that you want from me and I'll try to hook you up. Okay, office hours this week. Speaking of which, um, tomorrow I'll have my usual office hour, uh, 245 to 345, usual location. Thursday, I'll have my uh, office hour 11 to 1, usual location. Um, in addition, Miriam will have her office hour Fridays, 1.30 to 2.30. And Krithika, could you uh, raise your hand? So Krithika is our new TA. Uh, she'll be joining the team. And um, Krithika, does this time work for you? Tuesdays, 2.30, 3.30, good. Okay, and she'll be having her office hours Tuesday. So notice that we've spread out our office hours so that there's one every day of the week except Monday, um, because uh, I know you're very busy on Monday doing all kinds of things. I hope you're having fun yesterday. But um, uh, yeah, so every day of the week there's an office hour. They're staggered, so they're at different times, so you can have your questions answered. Okay, and again, um, Krithika is uh, a graduate student in my laboratory. She knows this uh, material as well as I do. She's really smart. Um, you can go to her office hour and get an answer that's as good as an answer that I will give you. Okay? And for that matter, you can also email the TAs with your abundant questions. Okay? I'm looking at you. Where I can't find that person. Okay, there's like one person in the class. He must send me 10 emails a day. But, uh, you know, I will do my best. But you can also email the TAs as well. Okay. Oh, along those lines, I sent you an email saying uh, don't send me book uh, or potential journal articles. And the reason is I, must have, I opened my inbox and I had like 15 of those. And uh, it got to the point where I was bouncing messages because the inbox was so full. So um, if you send me those, I can't do very much with them. Okay, it might clog my box. So what I propose we do is instead of you emailing me them, instead bring them to my office hours, bring them to Krithika's office hours or Miriam's office hours and ask your questions then. Okay? Um, now, the standard question I get asked is, is this uh, article appropriate? And my answer to that is if you follow the guidelines, it will be appropriate. Now, in addition, when you're writing your summary, your, your report on the journal article, Focus on the aspects of the article that fit the definition of chemical biology. Okay, so a paper in Cell, for example, is going to be a very meaty paper. It's going to cover about 10 pages. It's going to have, you know, eight or nine figures. And uh, some of those figures, some of those experiments, aren't exactly what we would call chemical biology. Don't focus on those. Focus on the ones that are chemical biology related. Okay, otherwise I don't know that you know the definition of chemical biology. Okay, any questions? All right, um, guess what? We're heading into the midterm season. Uh, this is week three, so week four is next week. Um, we will have a, a midterm next Thursday, a week from this Thursday. Um, there will be a review session in advance by the TAs, uh, time to be announced. Um, Krithika will arrange for this. Um, the seating for the midterm will be assigned. Miriam, you'll do the assignment. Um, it's really essential that you bring your UCI student ID. We will check the IDs to make sure you're seated in the right seat. If you're not seated in the right seat, it'll be treated as an academic honesty infraction. Um, no notes, no calculators, no electronic devices. You don't need them. You're smart. Okay? Um, any questions about the upcoming midterm? Okay, now I know you want to know what will be on the midterm. Okay, so let me tell you. It will cover through Tuesday's lecture one week from today. And so we will be about halfway through chapter four on uh, Tuesday. Okay, so plan to read through about halfway through chapter four. Um, that's the chapter on RNA. And that's where I expect to be for Tuesday's lecture. It's possible I might get behind, but I'm gonna really try hard not to do that. Okay? 
All right, I will also post a practice midterm to the website, and you can use that along with the discussion worksheets, the assigned problems, as a guide for what will be on the midterm. Okay, so the midterm will look very much like a compilation of discussion worksheets, of assigned problems, um, and the practice midterm. Okay, and it'll be about as long as the practice midterm as well. So when the practice midterm comes out, I'll post two versions. One version will be blank, one version will be the key, the blank version you should print out and then give yourself an hour and 20 minutes and make sure that you can handle it, okay? And uh, at the end of that, then check your answers against the key. But give yourself a real practice, okay? That's pretty important, I think. Okay, so anyway, um, that's the plan. Any questions about the midterm coming up? I know you will have lots of questions. I look forward to hearing about them in my office hours. All right. Um, I want to go back to finish up our discussion of uh, non-covalent interactions and um, uh, where we left off last time was with charge-charge interactions. I'm now ready to talk to you about, um, about interactions between atoms that are uncharged, okay? Neutral atoms that are interacting with each other. Um, these are described by a Leonard-Jones potential which is an equation that uh, describes how these neutral atoms would interact with each other. Another way of describing these neutral atoms, another term that's used and probably one that you encountered, is uh, a London dispersion force. Okay? So when you have two, say, neon atoms that cozy up next to each other, then um, they will interact through a London dispersion potential or force. And that's what I'm describing here. Okay? So it's just a couple of different ways of saying the same thing. This happens a lot in biology, not necessarily between neon atoms, but certainly between uh, aliphatic side chains, hydrophobic side chains in proteins, um, in interactions with each other, interactions with lipids at the plasma membrane of the cell, um, and uh, a whole host of other non-covalent hydrophobic, hydrophobic type interactions. This turns out to be a very potent um, and very strong force in biology. Okay, so we need to understand it better. Um, so the energy, the potential energy of a van der Waals interaction, yet another word to describe it, um, is equal to, um, uh, is proportional to 1 over r to the 12th minus 1 over r to the 6th. These terms, the sigma term deals with the diameter in this uh, epsilon ij, not so important, so let's ignore that. Let's focus in on the 1 over r to the 12th term and the 1 over r to the 6th term. <laughs> First, notice that it's minus 1 over r to the 6, and minus in potential terms means more stable in energy, lower on this y-axis of potential energy over here. Okay, so that's going to be our attractive term. Hydrophobic things attract each other, okay? Not just due to repel repulsion from water, we'll talk about that next, but hydrophobic things want to stick to each other, and they're going to do this with an attraction that's proportional to 1 over r to the 6. The fact that it's 1 over r to the 6 as opposed to r to the 2nd in the charge-charge interactions means that this is a much shorter range attraction. This attraction takes place on a very tiny distance scale. Okay? Now eventually, the, um, the, the two atoms, in this case, as described here, are two molecules, or two molecules, um, bang into each other and go past the point where they're attracted to each other. Okay, and at that point, their electrons are trying to overlap with each other. That's really bad news, right? We know by the Pauli exclusion principle that that's not allowed. And so, in the same way that my fingers are never going to fuse with each other, just going to bang off of each other, um, the atoms push away from each other, and they push away from each other with the repulsion force or repulsion potential that's proportional to 1 over r to the 12th. Okay? And so, this means that this is extremely short ranged and extremely sharp, right? To the 12th power is a large number. So this means that this really dramatically uh, pushes apart the atoms if they happen to uh, get too close to each other. Turns out that um, there are a whole series of other non-covalent interactions that we find in biology that actually contribute quite a bit of non-covalent binding energy. Here, for example, are the dispersion interactions that we've discussed before on the previous slide. And so these include things like aliphatic-aliphatic interactions, but also um, aliphatic interacting with um, hydrophilic, uh, hydrophilic uh, molecules. So here's water interacting with methane. 
they're going to interact with each other and have some uh, attraction. Um, this number here, minus 0.5 to minus 0.7 kcals per mole, is pretty low. Okay, this is not a tremendously strong interaction. Where it gets strong is when you have a molecule that has um, a hard, large number of functional groups, each one with 0.5 kcals per mole here, 0.5 here, 0.5 here. And when you sum up across all of those, you're starting to talk about big energy. Okay, now, just to give you an idea, you need to know um, one fact that I think is really important. <coughs> and the fact is important enough that I'm going to try to write it on the board over here in the corner. Um, the fact is that uh, a factor of 1.4 kcals per mole will be a factor of 10 in um, equilibrium constants. Okay, so 1.4 kcals per mole is a magic number in chemical biology. Okay, so look for 1.4 kcals per mole because that tells you that that's favored tenfold over non-binding. In other words, the interaction is going to be ten times more likely to form than not form. Okay, it's a factor of ten in terms of equilibrium constants. Okay, so if we're talking about something over here that's only 0 0.5, 0 0.7 kcals per mole, you have to start summing up a whole bunch of these to get anywhere in terms of enforcing the interaction. On the other hand, some of these other interactions can be quite strong. And let's take a closer look at those next. Okay, so um, for example, we've talked a little bit about um, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, of course, has a donor and an acceptor, and here's a range of strengths. Hydrogen bonds vary enormously in strength from about 1 kcal per mole all the way to 7 kcals per mole. The strength of the interaction depends enormously on the identity of the donor and acceptor. When the donor and or, and or acceptors are charged, if either one is a charged a functionality, the strength of this hydrogen bond goes up enormously. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because remember earlier I described a hydrogen bond as a kind of a special case of a charge-charge interaction in which a hydrogen is being shared between two atoms. Okay, so if one of these happens to be charged, that's going to be a much stronger charge-charge interaction. Speaking of charge-charge interaction, salt bridges are the coulombic potential that we saw on uh, Thursday. These are the charge-charge interactions. Um, these vary also enormously depending upon the environment that the uh, salt bridge happens to find itself in, where, a, uh, where water can shield this charge. Water or, or, or counter ions can shield this charge, decreasing it considerably and making the interaction much, much weaker. So a salt, a salt bridging interaction, a which is another way of saying charge, charge interaction, found um, in a hydrophobic environment, say the interior of a plasma membrane, is going to be a much stronger interaction than one that's found out in water where there's plenty of water and, and counter ions to shield the uh, charge. Okay, where those provide a counter um, against the uh, charge. Recall that those um, environmental terms are embodied by the 1 over 4 pi epsilon term um, in the Coulombic potential that I showed you on Thursday. Okay, in addition, there's also dipole-dipole interactions, which are, um, are uh, alignments of densities of charge where we have a little bit more uh, negative charge on the oxygen over here. The dipole is pointing in this way on, on the, to the right on the upper uh, acetone and to the left on the lower acetone. The two of these dipoles want to cancel each other out. By canceling each other out, that will um, give you a, a more optimal interaction and that's worth some potential energy. Finally, there's also a whole series of aromatic or airing interactions. And um, in general, these include both face-to-face -face interactions, where you have two faces of a um, benzene ring that are interacting with each other. Notice in this picture over here that the top benzene ring is offset from the bottom one. And this makes sense. We're going to be looking at regions of electron density interacting with regions of electron poverty. Okay, that that's actually the basis for the interaction. And so for that reason, we also see very commonly edge-to-face interactions. 
Okay, so this is the one that we'll see in a moment when we start looking at pi stacking in DNA. But in addition, you can have a edge of an aromatic system interacting with a face of another aromatic system down here. And that's um, as strong, right? It's, it has the equivalent strength. Even though you expect you know, face face to be ideal, that's actually not what we see when we start looking at large numbers of um, aromatic, aromatic interactions. We see these edge to face interactions all the time. Okay, and then finally, there's some other ones that are really bizarre, um, and they include charged interacting with uh, the electron-rich <laughs> aromatic rings. And this kind of makes sense, right? You have uh, something that's, um, that's uh, positively charged. You have something that's very electron-rich in terms of the ring system. So these cation pi interactions, which is what this one is called, um, are found pretty ubiquitously in biology. <laughs> oftentimes playing a commanding role, playing a really key role in uh, chemical biology. Okay, so these are ones that I'd like you to memorize. I'd like you to know something about their strengths, which one's strong, which one's weak. I don't want you to memorize the numbers per se, but I want you to know uh, something and be conversant on relative strengths. Okay, relative strengths matters. Okay, and one, thing, one last thing to keep in mind if we're going for this 1.4 kcal per mole, again, uh, you can have a summation of a large number of interactions to uh, achieve that 1.4 kcals per mole or even more. And I'll show you an example of that very shortly. Now, it turns out that it's actually a little bit tricky to start comparing energetics when you design in, say, the perfect cation pi interaction. Um, what ends up happening is uh, that uh, you, get all, you get a complication due to water. Okay, so let's imagine that you had designed in the perfect cation pi interaction and in doing so you put this positively charged thing that forces all of the water around it to rearrange itself and reorient itself. Turns out that's actually a complicated thing uh, of orient reorientation of water, but it cannot be neglected. Okay, so um, what we do is um, we make a very important simplifying assumption. And I'll talk more about water on the next slide. But before I do, um, water, since we, we just have to acknowledge in advance, um, water can complicate everything, right? It's present at 55 molar um, concentration in, in your cells, and um, we can't neglect it. Okay, it has its own energetics. It's, as, uh, as I showed on this slide over here, it, for example, it's interacting with hydrophobic things. Um, so its own energetics are really complicated, okay, and actually very hard for us to understand and pin down. And so um, it's really difficult to estimate the entropy lost or gained in an inter interaction due to that rearrangement of water when you start making changes. So what we like to do is compare things that are as similar to each other as possible. Okay, this is the simplifying assumption that I uh, alluded to earlier. Here, for example, is an example of that. Okay, so here's two possible transition states. Um, in transition state, are, are two possible mechanisms. Mechanism number one involves um, an SN2 reaction. Mechanism number two involves the same molecule undergoing an E2 elimination reaction. And the key here is that the molecules are identical. Okay, that, um, that uh, extreme similarity makes the comparison between these two much easier to make. Okay, and so for example, if we're looking at two proteins, we can look at empty protein versus ligand bound protein. But on the other hand, we're not trying to make all kinds of changes to the protein structure over here. Problem is, proteins are rarely, you know, like looking like this when the, when the ligand is unbound. So um, these simplifying assumptions will start to uh, cause all kinds of problems. Here's one though that works. Um, you can make a single change to the surface of a protein and then compare the altered protein, uh, compare its interaction with, the, with a ligand. So for example, we can change this isopropyl group to a uh, methyl group and then compare um, what's happened, what's different in that uh, receptor ligand interaction. Okay, so all you've done is remove two methyl groups. That's about as simple as it gets, right? Um, so that type of, a, that type of um, experiment is an easy one to make comparisons to. Okay, and again, by doing that, we're trying to minimize how much um, the water has to rearrange itself at that interface. 
Okay? It turns out actually this assumption works most of the time. So um, in short, uh, being good scientists, not changing lots of variables at the same time pays off in biology because underlying everything we do is this complicated solvent that we operate in called water. Let's take a closer look at the structure of water. Okay, so here is water in ice. And notice how neatly regular it is and how nicely ordered it is. And then here's water in a solution as liquid water. Um, and it's just crazy complicated. First, um, notice that um, there are all these dots, are, dotted lines are the hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds are pretty much maximized. Water is not passing up any opportunities to hydrogen bond to itself. Okay, but the hydrogen bonds in the liquid solution are non-optimal. Okay, water in solution, each water molecule is um, jam-packed with other water molecules and oftentimes the hydrogen bonds are slightly distorted or they don't have the right distances. Um, those little distortions and that lack of perfect distances makes the hydrogen bonds in liquid water weaker than they are in uh, solid water. Furthermore, um, a molecule of water in, uh, in its own, you know, with a lot of other molecules of water, is uh, it behaving kind of like it's on a crowded dance floor, okay? So um, it's bouncing around uh, wildly against its other, you know, molecules that are nearby and um, interacting with lots and lots of different molecules nearby, constantly breaking interactions and forming new ones. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay? So um, water is actually very complex. Weak and distorted hydrogen bonds. <coughs> Okay. Um, in addition, when uh, water cozies up to hydrophobic surfaces, it tends to form a very ordered structure that starts to look a lot like the structure uh, found in ice. And um, this, this works by water for, satisfies its propensity to form hydrogen bonds by forming a clathrate-like structure. So for example, here's a molecule of methane encapsulated in one of these clathrates of water, where clathrate is just simply a structure of water that satisfies its desire to form hydrogen bonds with itself, okay, or with other molecules of like kind. Okay, um, this really dramatically changes the strengths of nearby non-covalent interactions. Okay, this does things to um, strengthen those non-covalent interactions because every time one of those, um, let's just say, hydrophobic, hydrophobic interactions breaks, then water has to slot in between the now broken interaction and form one of these clathrates. Okay, that formation of the clathrate, the formation of an ordered structure costs energy. It, it's, it's a loss of entropy. This is a more ordered structure than the structure of disorganized water that I showed you earlier in solution. Okay? So for this reason, hydrophobic, hydrophobic uh, molecules are driven against each other. They um, want to uh, find each other in water. And um, this is sometimes uh, referred to uh, as a... Um, <coughs> This, this, is, uh, this is actually a water-driven effect. Hmm, forgetting the, the technical word for this. Miriam? <laughs> okay, anyway, so, um, oh, sorry. It's, it's, it's sometimes referred to as a hydrophobic effect, okay, in water. Okay, now let's take a closer look at a receptor ligand interaction, now zooming in at the level of atoms and bonds. This is a molecule called human growth hormone. And yes, uh, Lance Armstrong admitted to Oprah that he took human growth hormone to win, uh, to help him uh, recover basically from different stages of the Tour de France during all seven of his victories, which really annoys me actually. Um, I could say a lot more about that, but I'm going to hold myself back. Okay, now when human growth hormone binds to its receptor on the surface of cells, it, it's stimulating um, growth and recovery of those cells. It's stimulating protein production, etc. And um, when it binds to the surface of the cell, the, uh, to, the, to the binding partner on the surface of the cell, its receptor, then all of the region that's colored in on this surface is buried. Okay? So in other words, human growth hormone binding protein binds over here and then makes contact with each of these colored um, atoms. Okay, everything that's in white here is still out in water, out in the solvent. It's not interacting with the receptor at all. 
Now, um, when I was a postdoc, uh, I re repeated a classic experiment that was done by uh, Jim Wells. And Jim Wells and his coworkers found that even though there are 19 residues that are buried on the surface, there are 19 amino acids that are buried, only the ones in red are actually contributing binding energy. Okay, so notice that all of this other stuff is in, that is in blue that is buried is not at all contributing any binding interactions. So although there's, um, there's interactions between these side chains of this, these two proteins, there is no binding energy that's being exchanged or gained by that interaction. Okay, so just because two molecules find each other, two functional groups find each other in space, does not ensure that there's actually going to be a net gain in binding energy. Because again, that net gain in binding energy includes both the, the strength of the interaction, but must also include the water ordering and disordering term, which we've been calling entropy earlier. Okay, so in order for this interaction to take place, you're going to be pushing out ordered water and gaining some entropy in some places and in other places losing some entropy. Okay, now when we look even more closely, let's just zoom in on this red patch over here. This red patch has been termed a hot spot of binding energy. That's where the um, binding energy uh, allowing these two molecules to interact with each other is found. Okay, this is the essence of the non-covalent interaction between human growth hormone and its binding partner, human growth hormone binding protein. And in green, these are the functional groups that are found in this red patch. Okay, so the red patch is over here, and now I'm showing you the, the functional groups where in green, these are um, carbon atoms, um, in blue, that's a nitrogen, and in red, that's an oxygen. Okay, notice that the um, hydrophilic functionalities, the guanidine of an arginine over here, a bunch of nitrogens, another nitrogen over here, an oxygen, an oxygen over here. Notice that those are around the periphery of this red region. They're around the outside of this hot spot of binding energy. The center of the hot spot is largely hydrophobic. Okay, notice that it has lots and lots of carbons. There's a benzene ring, it's smack in the center. There's this aliphatic chain that's capped by an amine functionality, but nevertheless, this is an aliphatic chain. There's aliph aliphatic functionalities over here and over here and over here, etc. Okay, so in other words, the outside hydrophilic, the inside hydrophobic. And so when um, molecules, functional molecules find each other, this is a very common way for them to interact with each other through a small set of residues that form this hot spot of binding energy, which again kind of looks like a core sample through a protein. Outside is hydrophilic, inside hydrophobic. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, um, Let's talk one last, uh, about one last section of chapter tw uh, two before we move on to chapter three. Um, there's this concept that um, the biooligomers on Earth um, are highly modular. We've discussed this before. This also extends to the polyketides and the terpenes, which are composed of isoprenes, and the polyketides, which are, caused, uh, which are um, composed of either malonyl or acetyl uh, subunits that are strung together, where the red bonds indicate that where the connection between these modules, such as the amino acids, as individual modules in a protein. Okay, and furthermore, this is also found in oligosaccharides where you have this um, glycosidic bond that connects the glycan fragments together. Um, there's also a numerical amplification in biosynthesis. So um, if there's only one or two copies of DNA per cell, depending upon whether it's a, a prokaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell, um, some prokaryotic cells admittedly are more than one, but let's just simplify it. Um, then uh, to RNA, each DNA is transcribed 10 to 50 times, and then each RNA is translated, uh, say, 10 to 20 times. So in the end, you end up with this massive amplification of um, signal going through the cell, where with one copy of DNA, you can end up with millions of products from some enzyme reaction down here. Last thought, um, form follows function in biology. These, the um, bonds that join together, the oligomeric subunits, um, are, uh, are, 
have a strength that follows their uh, function, their functional requirements. Okay, and so for example, um, when we look at the half-life of lipids, we find that actually the ester bonds in a lipid have a half-life on the order of a year or so. Okay, so esters, not so stable. Compare that against DNA down here, which has a half-life on the order of 220 million years. Okay, that's its half-life for um, DNA. And um, in retrospect, this kind of makes sense, right? Because um, DNA has to be a, um, uh, you know, has to be a bioligamer for the life of the organism. Okay, and so um, we're now at the point where we're routinely taking advantage of this tremendous stability of DNA to amplify DNA from even extinct organisms like woolly mammoths, um, like uh, species of, uh, of uh, prototypical humans that haven't, ex haven't lived on the planet for tens of thousands of years. Um, that sort of thing is going on right now in laboratories, taking advantage of the tremendous stability of DNA. Now, um, your hair, which is a protein, um, has a lifetime on the order of, you know, 300 years or so. Um, and you can see that, right? We can find, uh, you know, we could, well, anyway, so um, I guess it depends on the human that we're talking about. My hair obviously doesn't exist that long. But, um, you know, so uh, certainly the lifetimes here are, um, are uh, following their function, right? Proteins don't have to last as long. Question? How does one get a PhD that's going to take you five or six years studying um, and trying to measure these half-lives of 220 million years? Anyone have any ideas how to do that experiment? I can guarantee to you it's not like, you know, you set up this uh, uh, test tube and then you check it every 20 years, okay? <laughs> to see how much gets cleaved. How would you do this? Yeah. How would you do it? Okay. A uh, small amount of RNA. Mm. I would use a large amount because very little is going to get <laughs> degraded. How would you do this, though? Yeah. Okay, but then you wouldn't know if the decomposing environment is different than in the cell, right? We want to know about the half-lives in the cell, right? Yeah. Could you use a model organism? Model organism. Mm, mm, now I want to know what it's going to be, what's going to last in, you know, in this cell or this other one over here. Question over here? Okay, you're definitely going to use radioactivity because you need something that's super sensitive. How would you do this? Okay, you're getting close. What is your name? Oh, Brian. Brian? Okay, Brian's getting close. So the suggestion was radioactivity. Brian's suggestion is you look for a tiny little quantity and radioactivity gives you that sensitivity. But um, are you going to do this for 220,000 years or 220 million years? Okay, so how are you going to do this experiment? We have the sensitivity. We're going to look for tiny little quantities and extrapolate back. <coughs> how are you going to model 220,000 years? Yeah. Carl, okay, uh, look at fossils. Yeah, we do that. Mm. Yeah. The uh, like isotopes, like carbon 17, you like know the half life for, so. Okay, C14. Uh, C14, what I said. Okay. So yes. You would compare it to that. You know the reactivity of one, and then you kind of compare it to the one that you know. Uh huh. And then Okay, so, but the problem is, you want to know all the conditions it's experienced over, you know, say 100,000 years or something, right? So, I mean, how do you, you want to do this in a controlled circumstance. You want to have everything just in a little test tube where you know exactly what's been added to the test tube, right? But you don't want to wait around for 220,000 years or 220 million years. What are you going to do?
OK, I'd like you to look this one up. <laughs> this is one that you uh, should be able to design. Look it up. Um, and then when we come back on uh, Thursday, we'll talk about this. But um, I'd like everyone to have looked this up. OK? This is important. Um, OK, let's, talk, let's summarize what we've been talking about in terms of non-covalent interactions. These are completely ubiquitous in biology. Good news, we only have to learn two equations which govern all interactions in um, chemical biology. Those were the Coulomb's law for the charge-charge interactions and the Leonard-Jones potential for the uncharged interactions. Okay? And so if we know those two equations, we're set. What's really important, what's important to us is not that we're going to be plugging in, you know, charge of this and then, you know, radius of this. What's important to us are the relationships, the distance dependence, the 1 over r squared versus 1 over r6. That type of distance dependence makes a big difference. And knowing that sort of thing and having sort of an intuitive grasp of that um, is going to be very important. So, and I'll just give you a quick example. Um, for example, um, we now know uh, if DNA is negatively charged, it's going to attract other charged ions to it uh, from great distances, right? Because it's distance dependent, it's only 1 over r to the second power versus 1 over r to the sixth. Um, in addition, we've learned that these non-covalent interactions are very sensitive to the environment, the distance, and the geometry. Um, water is uh, a really slippery molecule to understand, to, to say the least. It has a malleable structure, and um, it can dramatically alter the strength of non-covalent interactions. This makes it really tough for us to um, draw any generalities. Because water is um, an intermediate lubricant between all of these interactions. And it plays a complicated and sometimes hard, to us, uh, hard for us to define role. And there's still big arguments that are going on in, in water chemistry to this day. For example, um, there's an argument going on uh, about how many ions are found on the surface of water. Or, or what's the pH at the surface of water? Um, and there's been a set of dueling papers that have appeared that contradict each other. The first paper had a title like, the pH of, of the surface of water is more acidic. The next, article, uh, the next article by the competitor said, the pH of water at the surface is more basic. And, the two, and these groups have been arguing backward and forth and both making very reasonable arguments for years. Okay? The truth is, what we found is actually um, it's somewhere in between those two, and you can actually see evidence for either one, and it turns out to be a very minor effect that's not so important in biology. But the point is, is that water itself is such a complicated fluid that we're still using uh, the latest techniques to try to understand it better. It's not fully understood. Um, hydrogen bonds have donors and acceptors, and they're also very susceptible to uh, competition with water for those hydrogen bonds. Um, I would like you to know the approximate strengths, the relative strengths, not the approximate, but the relative strengths and distance dependence of non-covalent interactions. That's important. Okay, so that's a summary of chapter two. Any questions about chapter two? Yes, Chelsea. In the chapter two problems, there's some that yeah, I really want you to know that. Okay, that's super important. That's that Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Um, that hopefully you learned in Chem 1. You definitely need to know that. Other questions? Okay, let's move on. I want to talk to you about the structure of DNA. Um, this is the classic structure of DNA first proposed by Watson and Crick uh, in, I believe, 1952. Or, yeah, 1952, somewhere in there. Um, the, uh, this structure of DNA has two strands running in opposite directions to each other. So they're anti-parallel to each other. These strands are held together by phosphodiester bonds, which we'll look at more closely. So here's a schematic diagram of what the structure of DNA looks like. And here's a space-filling view where each one of these spheres is a van der Waals sphere to approximate where the atoms are, where the outermost electrons of the atoms are. Um, one thing to notice is that DNA has um, two grooves. Okay? It has uh, the distance here between these two strands is very close versus the distance here between the two strands being much further away. 
These are going to be called the minor and major grooves respectively. And this is the origin of the fact that DNA is a double helix. I think it's commonly thought that DNA is a double helix because it's two um, relatively rod-shaped molecules that are twisted with each other, but that's actually not the case. It's a double helix because it has a minor groove and a major groove. And I believe the next slide will show us that uh, more closely. Okay, so in blue, this is the major groove of DNA, and in green, this is the minor groove. In red, this is the phosphodiester backbone of DNA that we've seen before. Okay, so again, notice that there are two um, there are two helices that are running parallel to each other, a major groove and a minor groove. Okay, the structure of the bases is going to set up this major and minor groove relationship. As we will see shortly, DNA bases, base pairs, form a U-shape and that U-shape ensures that you're going to get a major and a minor groove where the inside of the U is going to be this minor groove and the outside will be the major groove. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. The reason why this is important is, as we'll see in a moment, proteins like to interact with the major groove of DNA whereas they can't fit in to the much closer interstices of the minor groove of DNA. Rather, small molecules will fit into this minor groove and try to largely avoid the less cozy major groove of DNA. Okay, so almost immediately we can start to make some predictions about where stuff binds, just knowing that DNA is a double helix, double by virtue of the fact that it has two parallel helices, minor and a major groove. So this DNA structure immediately sets up replication. This is the original 1953 paper by Watson and Crick. And this is the very last sentence of the paper in which they had this incandescent understatement. It has not escaped our attention, it has not escaped our notice, that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Okay, so if you have two strands of DNA running um, anti-parallel to each other, you can simply separate out the two strands and then get a perfect copy of one strand over here and a perfect copy of the second strand over here. Okay, so um, here's the, the, the parent strand of DNA and again, here are the two new strands in orange and blue. Note too that DNA forms a right-handed helix Okay, does everyone see that you can trace out along the right, with your right hand over here, um, the structure of DNA? I think it's worth trying that, whereas your left hand um, kind of slips off. It doesn't trace it out effectively. Okay, does everyone see that? So it's DNA is always a right-handed helix. Um, you know, so this beautiful structure of DNA uh, is, is one that was solved by X-ray crystal structure. Before then, there were a large number of wrong, incorrect predictions about DNA structure, including by people who I, uh, you know, think the world of, I think are, you know, absolute heroes in science. Uh, for example, the great Linus Pauling, who proposed a triple helix of DNA, where the phosphodiester backbones would be in the center of the molecule, and the bases would be out on the outside. This kind of this is uh, somewhat this is intellectually attractive if you don't think about the fact that you have two parents. Um, but uh, furthermore, it's attractive because at least the base pairs would be out here in space where they can interact with transcription factors. We now know, of course, that that's not correct. Instead, um, we'll we'll take a look in a moment at where the transcription factors interact. Um, before we do, let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, so DNA in the cell is concentrated in two, in two regions, a nucleosome in the prokaryotic cell, so it's kind of concentrated in the very center of an E. coli cell. In a eukaryotic cell, of course, DNA is found, exclusive, uh, is found in the nucleus and also the mitochondria, um, but let's just focus on DNA that's um, in the nucleus for today. Um, the bases themselves um, are connected together to form oligonucleotides through these um, phosphate, uh, these phosphodiester functionalities. Okay, so this is, um, this is called a phosphodiester functionality. Um, the DNA also has a directionality associated with it. Okay, so there's, um, if we look closely at this deoxyribose um, base 
there is a five prime end. There's a five prime hydroxy over here and a three prime hydroxy over here. And so the convention is to always write DNA in the direction um, from five prime to three prime. In the same way that we read English going left to right, DNA is always read out five prime to three prime. This is a really important convention. Okay, everyone on the planet follows this convention and I'm going to hold you to it as well. Okay, because if you read the DNA in the opposite direction, you get a different, uh, a different word coming out. Okay, it spells something else that might not be this, it will almost certainly not be the same thing and it might actually be, uh, you know, might actually cause a lot of trouble. So we're always going to be reading this five prime to three prime directionality. Um, so this sequence here would be read out as A, C, G, and T. Okay, where the structures of A, C, G, and T are shown here. Okay? Don't bother memorizing the, sorry, don't bother memorizing the structures of these. I'll simply give them to you on the midterm. Okay? So at a graduate level, you should know these. Um, Miriam will need to know these for her orals exam, um, but uh, the rest of you are in luck uh, because I'm not going to test you on them, at least for this class. Okay. Um, and again, the, C, the directionality matters a lot. Um, if there is a 5 prime phosphate, this 5 prime phosphate is indicated by a lowercase p. Um, finally, last, last bit of nomenclature, oligonucleotides that are connected together are often referred to as oligos, and that's how I'll describe them. Okay, now I realize oligos is not the most um, descriptive nomenclature because it just simply means an oligomer of something. But um, that's the convention that uh, we've been operating under for 50 years. Okay, so oligos will refer to oligonucleotides, uh, typically DNA oligonucleotides composed of deoxynucleic acid. Okay, now um, even though DNA is, um, uh, the bases of DNA are called bases, uh, it turns out they're not that basic and few are protonated at physiological pH. It's, this is kind of one of those historical uh, anomalies. Um, here's a bunch of PKAs, um, for example, starting with triethylamine. Uh, here's the PKA of the, um, uh, uh, the protonated triethylamine, the conjugate acid of triethylamine, PKA of 10.8. Um, here's the PKA of cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. And you can see none of these would be remotely considered bases. Whereas this one over here, um, triethylamine, definitely a base. Okay, as evidenced by the fact that it's conjugate acid is, um, uh, is you know, 10.8 pK. Okay, questions so far? All right, now um, DNA, of course, is missing a two prime hydroxyl. Okay, so here's RNA. It has a two prime hydroxyl over here. This two prime hydroxyl makes RNA considerably less stable than DNA. I didn't, I didn't point this out. Let me go back to it when we talked earlier about half-lives. Um, let me just zoom, zoom back to that really fast. Uh, the half-life of RNA is considerably lower than um, the half-life of uh, DNA. Okay, so here's the half-life of RNA, 220,000 years, whereas the half-life of DNA at 220 million years is much, much greater. Okay, a thousand-fold difference in um, uh, stability for the phosphodiester backbone of the DNA versus the phosphodiester backbone of RNA. This makes sense. Okay, the two prime hydroxyl of RNA sets you up for um, hydrolysis using a um, intramolecular attack. Okay, so here's um, again the structure of RNA. Here's the two prime hydroxyl. This two prime hydroxyl can act as a nucleophile to attack the phosphodiester backbone of the RNA, setting up cleavage. Does anyone want to see the mechanism of that? Okay. All right, let's take a quick look. Okay, so in this mechanism, let me just draw out the structures and then I'll blank the board. OK. 
Okay, one sec. Okay, so in this mechanism, here's our structure of Okay, so here's our backbone structure of um, RNA, and I'm just going to draw this as base over here. Okay? Okay, so um, if there is any base that's present, let's just say hydroxide, this can deprotonate the 2 prime hydroxyl giving us an alkoxide adjacent to the phosphodiester backbone of the DNA. This neighboring alkoxide can now attack the backbone, the phosphodiester backbone, giving you a five-membered ring intermediate, okay, which I'll show down here. five-membered ring intermediate, and um, this intermediate can collapse, leading to cleavage of the RNA. Okay, so here is that collapse. Okay, so um, we're going to be making two strands of RNA that are separated from each other. Okay, so here's one strand over here, and then here's the second strand down here. Okay, um, I'm going to just differentiate these as base one and base two. Okay, so notice that the, st the strand has actually cleaved apart. You can then hydrolyze this phosphodiester backbone, this, uh, this phosphodiester, back to a phosphomonoester -mono using another equivalent of hydroxide. And then finally, collapse of this tetrahedral intermediate gives us the uh, product. Okay. Questions about this mechanism? All right. Now notice again, if DNA lacks this two prime hydroxyl over here, and I just want to make this totally explicit. I'm going to label it two prime hydroxyl. <coughs> Three prime, five prime. Okay, so DNA lacks the two prime hydroxyl and therefore does not have an opportunity for this intramolecular nucleophilic attack on the phosphodiester backbone. So for this reason, DNA is a thousand times more stable than RNA, right? Lacking this intramolecular uh, uh, nucleophile. Make sense? Questions about this? Okay, let's go back. Um, turns out that when you look at the liability of um, the bases, we see actually a different trend. Okay, and actually I think I'm going to skip that. Okay, moving on. Okay, I'd like you to learn what I just told you. Don't worry so much about the base uh, stability. 
Um, DNA bases are subject to important modifications. These modifications have dramatic roles on the phenotype of organisms. Okay, so for example, um, methyl groups are often transferred to DNA. I showed you structures of the DNA bases. Again, they're subject to massive modification by uh, methyl transferases and other modifications. So, um, for example, here's 5 methyl cytosine over here, 4-methylcytosine, um, um, and then N6-methyl uh, adenine. Um, these modifications can dramatically alter transcription levels. They uh, can set up the organism to transcribe some genes uh, more often. Okay, so um, for example, um, uh, lacking pigmentation. Uh, the genes that encode uh, pigmentation are in my skin cells, my epidermal cells, yet they're not transcribed very often. And so um, it's likely that my DNA has not been methylated in those regions. However, when I go out and uh, spend a lot of time in the sun, um, I'm getting additional little spots called freckles, um, which are resulting from methylation of those uh, DNA sequences, which in turn then turns on transcription of the uh, pigmentation uh, uh, and results in freckles. Okay, so um, the environment, the environment that you're exposed to can alter this, uh, these transcription patterns. It's one of the ways that organisms like ourselves respond to changes in the environment. It's a very important way, in fact. And um, oftentimes this goes through uh, methylation of DNA. This DNA methylation is really as important as uh, sequence or genomics. And this is an area called epigenetics. That's really an area of very uh, active um, research that's taking place in chemical biology. Okay, so we've looked at structures of the bases themselves. We've looked at structures of the phosphodiester backbone. Let's start putting things together to start to understand the structure of DNA. Um, the bases themselves are slightly U-shaped. Okay, so here's a base between A, a and T adenine and thymine. Notice that uh, this base is composed of two hydrogen bonds. Here's a base of G and C, which has three hydrogen bonds. But notice more importantly that the bases are U-shaped, or equally importantly, okay, U-shaped here. The inside of this U, where the R is going to be the, towards the, the ribose, the deoxyribose ring, the inside of this U is going to form the minor groove, which I showed you on an earlier slide. The outside of the curvy part of this U is going to form the major groove. As you have these U's that are stacked on top of each other, and each one is slightly offset with each other, this is outside is going to result in a much bigger helix than the inside over here. Okay, and here's, um, here's what this looks like. Okay, so here's a trace of the phosphodiester backbone, and then I've highlighted just one Watson-Crick base pair. Okay, and um, again, notice that it's U-shaped, that there's more uh, section traced out over on this side, that will be the major groove, and the inside will be the minor groove. Furthermore, the green arrows define hydrogen bond donation and acceptance by the um, base pair. And notice that there is a pattern to this, that there is a, um, a, an ex acceptor, acceptor, donor. Okay, so this is a donor, acceptor, donor over here. So there's actually a little bit of a pattern to um, uh, whether uh, this is a G on this side and a C on this side or C and G on the opposite sides. So in other words, A and T are not the same as T and A because they're going to present a different pattern of, um, of uh, hydrogen bonds for molecular recognition. Where again, the proteins are going to be, the transcription factors are going to be interacting over here in the major groove and small molecules will be interacting in this minor groove down here. Mm, I should mention that there's also some protein pro, uh, DNA interaction in the minor groove. It tends to be more mi uh, minor, however. Okay, let's take a close look at one example of a transcription factor and how it works. This is the transcription factor phosgene. It consists of um, a uh, leucine zipper which is a uh, two helices that interact with the DNA like chopsticks. Okay, so these are fitting neatly in the major groove. It turns out the major groove has exactly the right size to accommodate an alpha helical protein. 
Okay, so this Fosjun is absolutely perfect. It fits neatly in the major groove. Now, these um, hydrogen bond donating functionalities are going to then read out the sequence of the DNA um, and look for a specific sequence of DNA to interact with. Trying to form complementary hydrogen bonds, trying to form complementary van der Waals interactions um, uh, in this sequence. Okay. Let's take a closer look now at the forces holding together the um, DNA double helix. Earlier, I alluded to the fact that AT base pairs form two hydrogen bonds and GC base pairs form three. Which one's stronger? Just, you know, from a crude approximation. Yeah, three is stronger than two, right? Okay, so um, in addition to this, the, um, the um, DNA structure is held together by pi stacking between the bases. Again, this is a face-to-face -face interaction. Typically not perfectly face-to-face. -face. Rather, it's um, typically offset. And that offset leads the bases to stack not directly on each other, but slightly twisted from each other, setting up this helical structure that we're now familiar with. Now, in order for this base pairing to take place, the base pairing that I showed on the previous slide, you need a particular tautomer of um, these aromatic rings. Okay, and the first one that should strike you as funny is this one over here, because you can imagine another resonance structure that would make this uh, C um, aromatic, right? Notice that the C has, um, is non-aromatic in this uh, tautomer shown here, right? It only has two pi electrons rather than the requisite six that it would need to be aromatic. Okay, that's almost, that's bizarre to begin with. Okay, so what's going on here is that there is a preference for um, this tautomer versus this one. This one's actually thermodynamically more stable. And the reason for this is that the carbon-oxygen double bond over here is quite strong. I will tell you that I think any chemist looking at this could not have predicted this in advance. And in fact, actually, this tremendously slowed uh, solute structure uh, determination of the original structure of DNA back in the 1950s. Watson and Crick were, were physicists and weren't as familiar with the whole no notion of tautomerization um, as their chemical counterparts who were racing to solve the structure of DNA. And so for them, this did not look funny. Uh, whereas to us, I think it does look funny, right? Because it lacks aromaticity, whereas the structure on the left is aromatic. Um, again, this happens to be just a little bit more stable because of the strength of the carbon-oxygen double bond, but I don't think anyone would have predicted that. Okay, I, I think now we, you know, with our 21st century guys, we could predict it, but um, going back in time, I don't think we could have predicted it so readily. Um, similarly, over here, these amidines um, are actually going to be more stable in the aromatic structure than in the amidine structure. And in this case, that's due to the much poorer overlap between a carbon-nitrogen double bond than a carbon-oxygen double bond. Okay? So, all of this leads to the base pairs with the hydrogen bonding preferences that are shown here. Okay, whereas, for example, this is a non-aromatic ring that could be aromatic if it tautomerized, but it doesn't prefer to be tautomerized. Whereas this one over here um, seems to prefer to have an amidine in this structure because of the strength of a carbon-nitrogen double bond. Okay, um, here's another example of that over here. This one prefers aromatic um, because carbon-nitrogen double bonds are relatively weak. Okay, pretty interesting, huh? Um, a natural basis, however, could dramatically shift these um, preferences for tautomerization. And a good example of this is 5-bromouracil. Um, okay, so if this compound here is um, fed to organisms, what happens is an unusual tautomerization pre uh, preference where um, the, uh, the, en the enol form of bromo U is actually more preferred than it would be if there was no bromine over here. Okay, so most of the time it forms the regular uh, base pair. However, some of the time it can actually form the incorrect base pair because it can actually more readily access this um, enol form of the, the base. 
Okay, so that's due to the electron withdrawing functionality of bromine over here. Okay, that's, pull, that's changing this to tomerization preference. The consequences of, the, of this are really dramatic. Because the um, Watson-Crick base pairing is not followed as closely, um, what ends up happening is um, the DNA comes out with all kinds of bizarre breaks and lesions. Okay, so here's um, chromosomes from a normal organism. I think it's a hamster in this case. Um, and then here's chromosomes from hamsters that uh, were exposed to bromouracil. And you can see they have all kinds of bizarre shapes to them. Things are incorrect. Okay, so the, um, this uh, causes cancer um, and uh, breakages in DNA, which then eventually lead to um, cancer, uh, cancer cells and tumors in the organism. Okay. All right. <coughs> So furthermore, it turns out that um, we can test this, the uh, importance of the strengths of these hydrogen bonds by um, synthesizing a natural basis. So this is one of the great things about chemical biology. If you have this hypothesis that something's important, then you could test that hypothesis by synthesizing compounds which are, say, missing um, that key functionality. So from Watson and Crick, we expect to find that hydrogen bonds are holding together the structure of DNA. And chemists went out and synthesized variants of DNA bases that were lacking that ability to hydrogen bond. Okay, structures of these are shown here. Okay, so for example, um, this compound here is simply a pyrene in place of a, of a base. And it actually prefers to, um, to base pair with a missing um, base over here. Okay, so these guys over here, no hydrogen bonding. No hydrogen bonding over here. And yet these actually prefer to pair with each other. Okay, so you can actually have completely unnatural bases, missing hydrogen bonds that are yet able to form um, base pairs with each other preferentially. What this tells us is that there's more to going on in DNA structure than simply hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a nice simplifying assumption uh, for our biochemical friends, our molecular biology friends. But in actuality, um, the, the pi stacking of DNA is a driving interaction. The um, edge to edge interactions of aromatic functionalities are also driving this interaction uh, uh, between the strands of DNA. And so while we can do quite a bit with hydrogen bonding, um, there's quite a bit more that's left to be explored. Okay. Um, last thought. I've been showing you, um, or it's not last thought. I've been showing you, um, oh, before I get to that, um, here's. Here, for example, um, is uh, this illustration here um, emphasizes the importance of pi stacking in here. Okay, so um, one uh, one thing is that bigger bases tend to pi stack better. For example, the guanine uh, base tends to pi stack better than, say, cytosine. Uh, in addition, I've been showing you Watson-Crick base pairing where it's a canonical base pair. G's and C's have three hydrogen bonds. A's and T's have only two. Other kinds of hydrogen bonding possibilities are not only possible, but have been observed. These were proposed by Carl Hoogstein. And um, we observe these a lot in RNA structure. We don't necessarily see these in DNA, but we definitely see these in RNA, and they're going to come up later. So I'll just show you the structures here. Um, this is a, an alternative to the usual AT base pair, and this is an alternative to the usual CG base pair. This one being driven by a protonation event, uh, protonation of this nitrogen over here. Okay, so this is actually, um, these are sort of edge to edge interactions rather than the sort of neat, more typical Watson Crick base pair. Okay, any questions about the structure of DNA? Anything whatsoever? I want to change gears then and start talking about how small molecules interact with DNA. Um, the first mode that small molecules can interact with DNA is to actually slip into this pi stack of DNA. So aromatic compounds can slide into the pi stack of the DNA, and we're going to see the consequences of this can be quite destructive. Um, let's take a look at some examples. This is a class of molecules called intercalators. Um, meaning that they intercalate into the pi stack of the DNA. They um, get uh, integrated into the DNA structure. Um, so uh, in order to fit into this pi stack, 
um, these molecules must be also hydrophobic and also um, aromatic, right? They will form competing pi-pi stacking interactions with the DNA, and so they must also be aromatic. Note, too, that in order to force their way into the pi stack, these molecules um, force the DNA uh, double helix to slightly unwind to accommodate the DNA intercalator. Here are some examples of this. Um, these are examples of uh, intercalators. Notice that they're all um, aromatic compounds. They're all flat and aromatic to slide into the pi stack. Many of these molecules also have positive charge. <coughs> positive charge is useful, right? Because the DNA with the phosphodiester backbone of the DNA is negatively charged. This gives a, the molecule a way to be attracted to the DNA through a long-range charge-charge interaction. Right? So these molecules are going to seek out DNA like a homing missile. And um, once they slide into the pi stack, the consequences can be um, pretty bad or actually fairly useful. Okay? Let me show you an example of a useful um, intercalation uh, over here on the right. This is actually an agarose gel, which is an important way that uh, chemical biology laboratories separate out DNA structures. D different DNA sequences can be separated out on the basis of their size using these agarose gels. I'll show you what that looks like in a, uh, a couple of slides from now. Um, to visualize the DNA, however, this molecule over here, ethidium bromide, is incorporated into the gel and um, it gets concentrated into the DNA by an intercalation interaction. So it slips into the pi stack of the DNA and it's a fluorescent molecule. Many aromatic compounds are fluorescent. We've talked about fluorescence before. And so you can actually shine UV light on the gel and wherever you see these, um, these pinkish bands, that's where the DNA is present. And so you can actually take a razor blade, for example, and cut out the DNA of a particular size. Um, Here's a couple of more DNA intercalators. Um, here's one that's designed to intercalate uh, and then have a little linker and then intercalate uh, down below the, the compound. Um, here's what it looks like struct structurally. So there's intercalator, linker, uh, intercalator up here, for example. I think that this is it right over here. Um, these are also um, compounds that are used uh, to treat cancer. So donomycin, adriamycin, are um, used uh, as anti-cancer compounds. They're some of the first rounds of anti-cancer compounds that are used uh, as chemotherapeutics. And um, we'll talk more about their mechanism of action um, later in the class. We're not quite there yet. Okay, let's stop here. When we come back next time, we'll be talking more about the structure of DNA.